Well, I tell you what, it's, it's been a, a beautiful Sunday morning and I get this wonderful phone call today and, and introduced to somebody that's on a program with me on All Saints Weekend, which is in the Lake Geneva area of uh, Wisconsin. Now, Susan, I'm going to put a, a description of what you do and who you do and links all down below, but it's really kind of funny because I don't know about you, I, you've been there before. Yeah. I, I get this call from a friend that somebody I really love and respect that, hey, do you want to do this? And I go, well, where's it at? She goes, Lake Geneva. <laughs> I said, yes, thinking Switzerland, right? I go, I'm all on board, man. Come on, you know, you know. I'll it's Jen's, well, it's Jen's, one of her favorite places in the United States is Lake Geneva. This is why she likes going there. It's a good meeting place for a lot of people, but it's very quaint. It's in an old historian hotel, you know, the Abbey. And um, it's just, it's got a lot of character. So I've been there. It's wonderful. A lot of people like it. It's it's very big, um, but uh, it's it's got its nook and crannies as well. <laughs> It's like those of us that are going to be there. Now, we are we are the presenters. I guess that's a good term as any. Uh, I'm opening up on the, the, the first night there doing a workshop, and then everybody's doing something the rest of the weekend, including myself coming back for an encore. And, I mean, if somebody's watching this now, they already know, you know, he's got another woo-woo person. What's going on here, right? But you have an interesting background and 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 doing some neat things. and. I want my audience, the people that watch my videos and new people that discover you and the people that know you to kind of know something new about you. So I'm going to I'm going to let you kind of introduce what it is that you do. Why, why do you think you got invited this? I'm looking at the list of people and I'm going, wow, these are all pretty powerful psychics and, and mediums and mm -hmm. healers. And uh, there's that vibration that of, of something really that's going to be a beautiful thing taking place. So, uh, so how'd you get involved in this otherworldly stuff? Let's, let's start there. What is it you do? How'd you get involved? In well, you forward? know, people ask me, did you, how long, before, you know, when you sensed you had the gift, blah, blah, blah. You know, I was six years old and I remember when my grandfather passed away and um, we weren't allowed to go to the wake and funeral. My mother thought we were all very young. She didn't want to traumatize us. So I had two brothers at the time. We were all a year apart. So I was six, five, and four. So after the funeral, I remember my mother standing on top of a chair next to a cabinet, and she's looking at some pictures. And I said, Mom, what are you looking at? And she goes, oh, they're not for your eyes to see. And she put them back in the envelope, put them on the top shelf, came down, got a phone call. Chair was still there. So a six-year-old is going to do what? Climb. And I can remember I was so small. I climbed. And even when I climbed, I couldn't reach the top. So I had to step on the shelves, you know? And I opened up the pictures and I saw my deceased grandfather. This is my mother's father who passed. And he's lying down and there's these beautiful flowers around him and he's lying down so peacefully looked like he was sleeping did not look morbid at all in a beautiful navy blue suit and I thought hmm how come he's there when he's here so that was my first knowing the difference between passed on and in the present and that's when I started to realize what a spirit was. But I have been seeing dead people my whole life. When I see dead people, it's like I'm seeing somebody just like you. There's no orbs. There's no translucent. It is an actual person in spirit form. All right. So anyway, time goes by. I've always had this. And then when I was about 18 years old, Chicago police was looking for a missing college student. And I kept seeing it advertised. And this boy who was Indian. Um, I thought, okay. And I said, help me help you. Where are you? He goes, I'm in the water. And I said, yeah, but they said that they can't find you. They looked and they searched you in the water. He goes, they're not looking in the right place. He goes, come with me and I'll show you. So what I did was I called a very dear friend of the family, my goddaughter's boyfriend, who now is a husband. And I did started to tell him, you know, what was going on. And he goes, you know what, Suze? He goes, let's go take a ride. He goes, let's go look. And he goes, show me where you're, wh what you're getting. And I did. So he called everybody in the police and the professional divers and the diving team. 
And I said, you're looking way out there and he's right here. They're like, it's impossible. I go, no, it isn't. He's telling me where he is. I'm telling you, he's right down there. And he was, he was trapped underneath seaweed and they found him. So now when they hoisted his body up, they all said, Susie, you don't want to see this. I says, no, I do want to see it. And they, and now this poor boy was missing for about seven days. So you know how dismembered his body was. And I did, and I looked at it, but now I'm seeing him here who looked perfectly fine. So this way, this did not bother me. And I looked and I just said, thank you. And he says, thank you. He says, now you're giving my family peace. They have a closure. And his family were all in India and they flew in to try to help find this missing college student. And there was no foul play because everybody was wondering foul play. I says, no, he was drunk. He was walking from, you know, the bar and he slipped and he fell and right there. And he did try to get up, but the seaweed suffocated him and he was drunk. And there's the story. So that was the first time I really got Chicago police's attention. So then when other people started going missing, I started to get them coming to me, spirit. And I would map them and I'd say, okay, this is where this one is. This one's dead. This one's still alive, blah, blah, blah. So through the years, I started to have a really good track record with the Chicago police. And let me tell you, I have very um, high people in high places. So 42 years later, I'm going to be 61 in August. Um, still a kid. Yeah, well... <laughs> There are times when I don't feel like one, <laughs> but I graduated to FBI and CIA now. I've worked under three presidential cabinets. So trust me, um, I do a lot with police and investigative work. I can map out people, found people that have Alzheimer's that are missing. I found where they were, even dogs that are missing sometimes, not always, but sometimes. But the moral of the story is that's my biggest passion is working. You know, I've got a lot of vets and I do a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder because their big thing is watching a buddy being blown up and why wasn't it them? And now they're coming back and they're coming and talking to them. And it's interesting because they said, you know, I've been in therapy for six hours or six weeks and, and, and it, I'm with you for an hour and it just, it, it, it makes sense. I've got somebody who was in therapy for 12 years, started talking to me and I'm saying here, this is what happened. I go, you know, Gus and Joe, and they're all coming back telling me this is why. And the reason you were spared was because you got work to do here. And I go into great detail. And then telling them, you could either keep feeling bad or just say, okay, nine out of 10 times when, unfortunately, in war, you die pretty suddenly. So is there any suffering? The answer is no. The suffering is what you take in by witnessing all of that because it's very tragic for the person still behind. So, um, yeah. But anyway, I was doing this for many, many years and I didn't come out publicly because quite frankly, I didn't want to. You're going to say, seriously? No, I didn't want to. Then one of the sergeants in Chicago said, Suze, why aren't you doing this for more people and coming out? I said, you know, I, I don't want to tell you the truth. I want to be left alone. I, I like that you guys have me. It's great. And I'll, I'll work for you guys anytime when you need something, but I really don't want to do it. And he said to me, well, you know, I think it's kind of selfish that you're not coming out. So I remember I was so upset that he said that to me. I said, my God, you got me 24 seven. I'm working two, three o'clock in the morning for you guys. I said, I have a baby at home. I said, so, and he says, no, I don't mean it in a bad way, but there's a lot more good you could do. So I went home and told my husband this and he goes, well, I agree with him. I go, you too. And he goes, yeah, he goes, listen, I'm not going to force you. Take two, three days, really think about it. I think you could do a lot more good with people, but just remember something. Once you come out, you're going to be like a gay person coming out of the closet. Once you're out, you're out. He said to me, I'll never forget that. He goes, so I really want you to think about it. And I did. And it took about maybe three, four days. And I said, maybe I should do it. I go here. Here's how I'm going to put my faith. If God wants me to do this, he'll make a success out of me. If not, I'm still good. I'm working with police. I'm working for FBI. I'm okay. Well, literally it took less than three months and I was on the number one top Chicago psychic. Um, started getting radio invitations, um, WLS, um, Fox, 
television, all of that were all coming. And I quite frankly didn't know how they were finding out about me. But then I thought, well, if God wanted this, so you know, God kind of opens up your path. So that's where I am. So, you know, but I have an office in Oakbrook. I split my time up in, you know, Chicago. I'm a Chicago girl. Six years ago, I moved to Arizona. So now that's another state that I take on. But I do have an office in Oakbrook, Illinois. And I come to Chicago about once a month. And, you know, I have a lot of stories to tell. One day I'll make, I'll not just write one book. It probably will be about 12 to 14 books. And you're going to say, seriously, that's how many stories I have to tell. But you know what? I'm not in for the notoriety. I don't need to be a great author. I know what I got to do. And I don't get hyped with all this stuff. But the people that know me, they always come back. And um, what do I do? Well, I get, you know, a medium. I'm a psychic medium. So I get in touch with spirits, your loved ones. But then also I do a lot of missing persons, post-traumatic stress disorder, predict the future, three presidential cabinets. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, paranormal investigation. So when you've got bad juju in the house, let's see what's there. Is there such a thing? Yes. And sometimes people don't realize that they're the ones bringing it home from maybe their work. I have a lot of police officers, firefighters that I do, and their careers are great, but their personal lives wreak havoc. So I go in there and then I start seeing things and my God, am I able to get rid of them? So I take the attachments not only off of the home, off the people and off the land. And now they can start living a decent life harmonious life. A lot of kids go through a lot, go to bed, they get scratch marks, there's bruises. There is a difference between a spirit and an entity. And I get rid of those entities. So, you know, there's a lot that I do depending on the person and the story and what they've got. But yeah. So, all right. So when you're in Chicago is, uh, and you go back there, is uh, Jen one of the people that discovered you? Did she interview you? Oh, um, what do you mean? Um, in Chicago? Yeah. Said how everybody in Chicago knows me. I've done all the top top politicians. Every single top politician in Illinois has seen me. Those They're... in jail and out of jail, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. You know? Um, I do. Um, I'm also a huge medical intuitive. That's another thing um, that I pride myself with because I get the messages of what's going on in your body. And I will tell you, I cannot tell you how many people that I said, go take this test, go take that test. And I saved them from having cancer or at least cancer from spreading. So yeah, medical intuitive. I've had that gift since I've known since I was seven. And uh, so it's real. I feel what other people feel. So I will get a pain. I'm like, Ooh, I don't feel right. It, I get the pain. So it's noted for me. And then I can tell you about it talk you through it but yeah right on the money on those things but medical intuitive so if you have health concerns definitely i can pull you apart and dissect you mm -hmm. so you're now out there publicly and i'm assuming that you're offering these services for people in arizona and illinois yeah, and, yeah. And, uh you also talked about at least i thought you did pre-conversation uh working with the military uh, yeah be part of that program? Well, what I do is I have a lot of therapists and psychotherapists that actually give me their clients when they don't know what more they can do for them, which I really think is a great psychotherapist who's honest about that. Um, but when they have the post-traumatic stress disorder, I work with them. And uh, it's, it's beautiful and it's heartbreaking all at the same time. But do we make headway? Oh, God, yes. Yes, we do. Yeah, I'm, um, I've, I've been working with PTSD vets for a long time. That is a, it's a hard road to see progress. I mean, it's, you work with somebody and you work with somebody and uh, the traditional methods don't necessarily work much at all. No. Especially when they start drugging people up is the answer. <clears throat> but, um, I agree. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. And, I'm always open to new methods and uh, so you're obviously reading these people you're, you're, and you're, you're focusing on what the issues really are. Why don't you just talk about that just a little bit? I'm curious because that helps my work and what I'm trying to do. Well, you know, they come home after what they've seen 
and they try to bury it and they try to be tough about it. They try to be logical about it, but it still haunts them. Sometimes they have bad dreams. Sometimes they're going back and, you know, some little thing will trigger and they're right back at, in war. And that's the thing that I work on because it's, here's basically what it is. They, they don't know how to make their peace with it. And, you know, yes, I believe in therapy and all of that, but sometimes the traditional therapy will not work for them. Sometimes a psychic medium who can go in depth would do really, really well with that. And that's something I would definitely tell you. So yes, this is very, very important, but being able to get down to the nitty gritty, you know, um, I was supposed to do many years ago, A&E wanted to give me my own show. And it was going to be my daughter and myself. And it was called Haunted Heroes because we were going to be strictly for the military for post-traumatic stress disorder. And my daughter has my gift as well. She doesn't use it the way I do. You know, she's got her own career and God bless her for it. But we were going to do it and A&E wanted me. And I was the first person in, that ever turned down A&E because basically when you sign up for these shows and these shows don't make it maybe past a season, they still own you. They get all your rights. And I thought, uh, no, I'm, I'm not about being greedy, but you know what? I can be left alone. I don't need to be famous in that respect. So I, I passed. <laughs> There's been lots of LA producers wanting to do shows with me, okay? And make a show around me. And I'm just like, no, because it never felt like it was going to be the right one. You know, um, so that was something that's important. I, you know, my husband always said to me a long time ago, when you do what you do, the money will come. And it could be in something that you never expect that you're going to make money at it. But when you're meant to do something, I truly believe God sees a way for you to keep going so you can be successful, so you can do what you're supposed to be doing in this lifetime. So I do believe in that. I don't believe in the greed, though. Okay. But you know, so many people, and there's a lot of psychic mediums, they all act like it's for the greater good. But then when you look at their prices and then you look at this and they're always raising, I have never raised my prices in 40 years. Do you know that? I am dealing with 40 year old prices and people go, you know what, you're working too hard, you have to think smart. I said, no, because I promised myself a long time ago, I was never gonna be for the rich. I am gonna be for everybody because everybody has the same problems. And why should they be excluded? Because they don't have an extra 150 bucks. I'm not doing that. I'm not gonna charge $800 for a half hour. Could I get $800 for a half hour? Yeah, I know I could. Okay, I've got stars in Hollywood that fly into Chicago to see me. And I, and I see them after hours, just like I'd see the politicians. It'd be after hours. Nobody would be there. Police would come. There would be a police at every exit of the door, making sure everyone is safe. I, look, I can tell you the drill. I know how it goes. But you know what? It, it isn't about that. It's just about giving them the messages, but helping them guide them for better careers, children, marriage, health. P, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever you got going, you know, and that's something a lot of people have guilt when a child dies. Maybe I wasn't a good enough parent, you know, maybe if I did, I would have, I should have, I could have, I said, nope, it still was going to happen. So really educating people that here's what I tell people, you can't compete with God. All right. And there is a soul contract, our book of life. And not everybody's going to live till 90. And it doesn't mean you failed. So I do talk about real life stories. I have a, a YouTube channel, you know, and um, I've had it for years. And I talk about psychic stories, real stories. And um, there was, as a matter of fact, I made videos this morning. And there's a video I talk about about a mother who lost her 24-year-old son to a tragic car accident. And she says to me, and it was funny because her son came through. And when he came through, I said, you know, it's really funny. He never pictured himself living a long life. He never saw longevity. And she looked at me and she said, how did you know that? And I said, did he ever say that to you? She goes, no, but I, when I gave birth to him and I was, and he was in my arms, he was just this little snuggle thing. He was not even, he was minutes old, she said, Susan. I was so proud and happy and tired. But then when I was looking at him, something said, you're not going to have him long. And I thought, what kind of a message is that? Why am I thinking that? And then she says, maybe it's postpartum. And I'm just going like this. 
And she goes, you're right. She goes, but I always had the inkling that I wasn't going to have my son for longevity. So when you said that, you were spot on. So I said, but here's the thing. It didn't matter if you got in the way and said, hey, you're not going out tonight. He still would have gone a different way. You can't get in the way of God. And you can't compete with God. And you cannot micromanage. It is God's way and it's his will. And you say, really? Yeah. And she's crying. And I said, the way, and look, I can't take the pain away and I never will. And you will always have pain. It's the, you know, anesthesia without, you know, the amputation without the anesthesia, I said to her. But in order to make your peace, you can't compete with God. And when he was a little boy and you left him with a babysitter, how did you feel? Did you feel pretty confident? She goes, I did. And I go and it allowed you to go and have a good time for that evening. She goes, yeah. I go, well, why don't you think of him that way? He is with the best person watching over your son, which is holy God. And that's how you got to do it and feel safe and feel okay. And I promise you, once you make your peace with this, your son will come in your dreams because your blockers are down and you stop wearing the invisible veil. So about two weeks later, she emails me and she says to me, holy cow, Susan, I made my peace. I cry, I think about him, but I'm able to go on. And you want to know something? That night he came to me. And since then, I've had three reoccurring dreams. And you said, we were going to be talking and visiting. I said, those are visitation. These are, tr these are real. But when you have your blockers down, that's when spirit can come through. When, you, when you're upset about something, you cause blockers and it can't come through. Here's the spirit. You bring it down, boom, spirit comes through. And she goes, it's amazing. And when I woke up, I felt exhilarated. And I know it was real because I talked to you and you told me this was going to happen. I just needed to make my peace. I said, and I bet he looked great. She goes, he looked perfect. He looked wonderful. And I go, that's the image I need you to hang on to. So it's really trying to make people understand a deeper depth of what universe is, but the concept of God. Do I do black magic? People, I, I'll sometimes get emails. I lost my boyfriend. Can you put a spell and bring him back? I'm like, no. <laughs> people like that give me a bad name. Please don't associate with me. I am big on the Lord. And I just did a video, I can tell the difference between people that pray and have God in their life and people that don't. There's a big, huge difference in trying to find your way back to God. Look, these life experiences, do you want to know why we're living them? Because the sole mission is to go through as much experience to be as close to God-like as possible. And I truly believe we stay then in eternity with God. This, you know, people go, this is how on earth. I said, no, this is school. We're here to learn. And if you're a good pupil, you'll take the lessons and not be bitter. I always say, you always have to be better, not bitter. You have to learn. And it's a message. I always say people that you meet, they're either lessons, blessings, or both. There you go. Instant bumper sticker. I love it. Now you're in Arizona, and I know Arizona has uh, a lot of these conferences for uh, parents of lost children. I don't even, uh, I've spoken to a couple of groups there. I can't remember the names of any of them, but I'm sure that your work on with parents is like never ending. Never. It's like, I don't know how you close up shop and say, well, it's all the time I got for this week. No, I don't. I don't. I'm, I've gone many times over and, you know, just making them understand that there's something bigger than what we can only see that's the whole thing it's not goodbye it's just the beginning you know i tell people when people pass on um they've elevated ever all their work here is done now you're going to say seriously yeah because the purpose and the mission to what they set out to you may not understand it a, a day old baby that just lived for a day the miss message the mission was done and we say, oh, my God, how could this happen? Of course, it's a horrible thing. But when you really sit down and really see it on a spiritual side, and this is what I try to tell people, on a spiritual side, it's everything. But knowing that 
this was it. The only thing that constitutes it in a different way is if somebody has suicide because you took matters in your own hand and you got in the way with your soul contract with God. I do not believe you rot in hell for that. I do not um, because I've had many suicides and they've come through and they have this beautiful light around them. God will give you as many chances as need be, but we come in different levels. We leave in different levels. So this is school. What we are here to go through and experience, but God doesn't care about the experience as much as how are we going to pick ourselves up? Because that truly is the test. It's not what's being done. It's how we're going to behave of what's been done. That's the true test. And I try to educate people in that and keeping their mindset on that because it's so easy to get stuck and um, you have to see a little bit past. So it's, it's more than just making contact with their loved one it's then seeing okay we made contact the messages were were you know exchanged but now where do we go from here you know it's like when a when a parent has a child and they go get the child diagnosed and now the child's diagnosed as a autism okay that's fine they got the diagnosis and then what do parents now do with this type of child okay they don't know right same thing okay we make contact with your child with your loved one what now and that's where I come in. So I like to finish that journey and keep going with that. You're more than just a psychic. You're kind of a, a spiritual coach, if I could be looking for a better word, more than a life coach. Yeah. I mean, you're talking careers and, you know, right. money. No, spiritual coach, somebody that kind of directs what's your purpose. You help people find, would that be true to say, yeah. you help people oh, yeah. find their purpose and their path? Many times somebody will say, you know, I want to do this and this. I'm like, nope, it's not going to, you're not going to be successful. They're like, why? And I go, because that's not what you're meant to do. This is what you're meant to do. I had a teacher. She's an, she was an assistant principal on Thursday and she wants to walk away from the profession. She's just so disgusted with how things are running and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And I turned around and she goes, what else do you see me doing? And I said, I think you should stay in what you're doing. Just change it up. I said, how about being a guide for these parents? Because these parents don't know what to do with their kids today and actually teaching them. And when um, somebody is being diagnosed, how about providing a list of resources? Where do we go from here? Stay as an assistant principal, but on the side, open this up. You would be a wealth of knowledge helping these parents and actually making a difference. And you actually saying, I like this. I feel good now. You feel like you can contribute because you're not mandated by district law. And I, 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 she gave me the most beautiful email at the end of the day. And she just said, for once, I know where I'm going. And thank you for not quitting on me. Because if you would have said to leave, I would have gone. I was looking for that validation to leave and you did not give that to me. <laughs> and I said, because you're too talented. <laughs> Oh, we, we we need we need those good people teaching, and uh, and serving, and and to me, I always tell people because I get tired of these uh, graduation speeches from all these celebrities. You can be anything you want to be. Go to a job that you love to do, and then you're not working, and you know, and all that stuff. And and I got just the opposite philosophy. I'm saying whatever you're doing, love it. You know, it's funny you said that because I have somebody, and she got very successful very quickly. And yes, she's doing the work and everything, but the um, idea what she came up with and now she's going to be a motivational you know manifestation and you know getting paid 20 30 thousand dollars to speak and I said you know let's be honest I said it was just luck you were at the right place at the right time with the right concept now what you did with it is your brains but when you tell people this I think you really need to be honest about it that you never thought in a million years you would be this famous and big and bankable, okay? You're just saying if you manifest it, it'll come and blah, blah, blah. I go, why don't you just be real and say this to people, okay? Because this is what I say. Sometimes we will think of something and it takes, and it does. I've seen it happen to many people. But I said, be honest with how you got there. Yeah, I, I've seen people 
I, I'm going to be an NBA basketball star. And the guy barely, you know, can play, he's five foot two, right? 180 pounds. It's like, come on, you got to get real at some point. You can't be what you man, try to manifest on a, on your refrigerator or some chart someplace, you know, with little happy pictures. And, and then again, I teach people that in my uh, uh, way, when I go out and lecture is it's not about manifesting stuff. If you spend all your life manifesting stuff, when do you get around to manifesting happiness and inner peace? That's what you should be manifesting on your little board. You know, happy marriage, happy life, you know, beautiful children, but a new car, new job. It's, it's, it's things that people are trying to manifest. You know, it's funny you say that. I really agree with everything you said, Bill, because my vision board, do you want to know what's on it? All, yeah, my, I'd love to. I'd love all, to. My, all my weaknesses. And I have it right here. And it's all my weaknesses. Um, a healthier day ahead. Discover a new you. Now I can. Patience. Laugh more. Let go. Get happy. Inspired spaces reinventing you let the sunshine come in these are all things that I still am working on because I tell people when you want to manifest something work on your weaknesses because they become your strengths and then everything starts to manifest of what you want without asking for it that's right God knows what you need people don't want what they need they want what they desire two different things so true. You're but your right. little board there, if you if you ever get a chance to read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, yeah, he kind of did that. He made little cards with be humble, be honest, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Yes. And he had them and he kept them and he would he'd carry it with them for a week, that one card. And he'd read it every time he had a moment waiting for something or he'd read it, he'd read it in his mind. And then the next week he took a, he had like, like, I don't know, he must have had 20 cards or something. And then it repeat. He did that the rest of his life. He didn't start doing it until like he was in his sixties because he found out from all these people complaining about him being a, not such a nice guy, arrogant and all egotistical and all that stuff. And that's when he started to change and become the statesman and started being diplomatic and just by practicing, you know, humility which he wasn't high on, but I was like, humility, got to be humble today. Got to be humble today. Got to be loving, got to be forgiving. Anyway, it started with him. And that's what I believed until I read the autobiography uh, from uh, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola, the guy that started Jesuits. Love that. He did the same kind of thing. He had a list and then he worked on these. So you're right in the line of the saints and the sages and the politicians. There you go. It's, it's it's a good thing. I like it. Well, on my YouTube, I have a whole Archangel series on there. And I just got through doing um, a workshop with Jen about the saints and what do they specialize in? And a lot of times, you know, people go, well, when you pray, you just pray to God. I said, you pray to God and you pray to God's extensions. Who do you think created all of them? They are one with God. You bring everybody to your table. And believe me, you will feel their presence unbelievable. And you will. It's very, very strong. And I pray every day, all day. And I have sessions back to back to back to back. I don't even leave a break because if I stop, I get tired and I'm, I'm done. So I don't eat and I don't stop. Okay. That's the way it works for me for the 42 years of my life. Professionally, I've been doing this. But I'm going to tell you, when I do this stuff, it's interesting because I always say a prayer for people when I say goodbye to them, just to make sure that they stay on the right path for God to give them the strength. And I want them to start forgiving themselves for being so angry. And I yeah, tell so let's, let's talk about that. Cause I, I gave a workshop just, I'm finding out that almost everybody in my workshop, I mean, almost unanimously, people never really true. And the more spiritual they appear to be and think they are, the more intolerant they are of their own mistakes. They right. don't forget themselves because they know better. They should. Yeah. yeah. You but you're human. You have to remind yourself you're human. You're learning. The day you stop learning is the day it's over. Yeah. But I've noticed something. I think, you know, people have been going in a bad direction. I call this spiritual warfare. It's good against evil right now, more now than ever. But I also think that ever since COVID, people have become a lot angrier. Um, and I see it. 
I don't like it. I don't like all the drugs and the shots that's being pumped into people because I, you know, I always say whatever shot you're putting into your body goes five times fastest to your brain then evenly distributes throughout your body. I'm very big on uh, wellness and a holistic pay attention to when your body speaks because when it's not good and it's in pain, your body is speaking to you. You know, too many people put all their trust in doctors. And I really don't think today's doctors are of yesterday's doctors. I do not believe that. There's still some good doctors. You don't get house calls, doctor, come into your house. Remember that? Are you old enough to remember that house yeah. call? Well, my, my grandfather was a doctor. My dad, my grandfather was Actually a go to somebody's house. Yeah. My grandfather was a doctor and a dentist and he had 14 farms. He had 14 children, my father being the youngest of 14. He gave each child a farm and he taught, he taught them how to farm, but he also taught them to grow herbs and to make the herbs. And he taught each child and how to heal the body. I come from a family of this. My grandmother was a school teacher. Okay. So my father was very much into pay attention to what you're feeling. You got this, take a aloe, a aloe leaf or take this, or if you got a zit on your, on your, on your face, Take a swab and take the earwax from that and put it on that. It'll dry it up. And sure enough, it was true. Old remedies like that. And, you know, my father taught me that. But he said, I remember I was in between his legs. He's lying down. It was a really hot day. And I was about, look, I could have been born five, six years old. I remember a lot of five sixes. And I remember laying down and we were looking at this big tree. And how people were cutting the tree and it was right smack in summer. And as they're cutting the tree, the sap is coming out and you see it coming down the bark. And I said, Daddy, look at all the, the sap. And he goes, that's not sap, that's tears. And I said, what? He goes, if I cut your arm off, do you think it would hurt? I go, yeah. He goes, well, that's what they're doing. You only cut the tree. I mean, major cutting, not trimming, he said, major cutting. You do not remove big branches until late fall into winter because it goes dormant. They don't feel it. This tree is crying. And I go, oh, well, what can we do? He goes, there's nothing. We don't own the tree and they're doing it. And I said, that's sad. He goes, it is. He goes, God's created everything and we as man will ruin it. And I remember that. So when I was about 22, 23 years old, I said, you know, dad, I don't know if you remember, but remember when we were, I was on top of your lap and you were laying back and I was laying on top of you and we were looking at that tree. I go, do you remember that? He goes, yeah, I do actually. I taught you when the tree cries. I go, you do? He goes, yes, I do. I go, do you really think that man is going to destroy this earth? He goes, yes. God gave us a lot of beautiful things man will destroy it yeah as I well now my father's passed but I remember my father telling me all sorts of things and now I see it and I hear his words every day and it's really sad it's sad you know the weather is so sporadic the ozone layer is getting worse in 10 years we this earth will not be fit for human consumption of just breathing People are going to have more asthma. People are going to be on, you know, the, the breathing machines. And I see it. I feel it. I really do. I feel it very, very strongly. They are ruining it. You know, you get mudslides and you get, you know, rain and then you get the tornadoes and the hurricanes. And here, you know, we're at 124. It's 119 in Phoenix, but we're seven degrees more than where we're at. So it's like 124. I mean, it is so been hot that it's not normal to be this hot. You feel like it's a hot iron on your skin when you go outside. So I, my father's words come to me a lot. They do. They really do. Wow. So I'm going to be seeing you and meeting you in the person. Uh, in November, I think the first weekend in November is the All Souls weekend. Right. And you're going to be doing, I'm assuming, doing consultations and readings. I will be, yes, I and, will. And uh, so the people that were looking for that, you will be there. Yeah. Uh, and what would you like to leave with us? I mean, I'm just, you're throwing a lot of beautiful ideas out today and a lot of things that opened up a lot of conversations. But if you were going to give, people advice on their life 
what was your main thing you tell people? You know, they came to you. I mean, what's, how do you see them going forward, us as a race? Well, don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Don't be in competition with yourself. Run your own race. I'm not a competitive person. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I remember when I first started and I used to be at the Mind, Body and Expo, you see all the psychic mediums on the first floor, okay, to the left. You know where I would be? Second floor by myself up there, but there would be a three hour waiting line to see me and they'd be downstairs just playing cards. Interesting, isn't it? I, I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't even go on every, other people's pages. I, I'm, I, I don't feel... And I'm not knocking anybody, but it's not who I am. I'm my own person and I'm going to help you the best way I can, but I'm real about it. And when you're honest enough to ask the right questions, you will actually get the right answers. But when you see me, you are not going to hear what you want to hear. You're going to hear what you need to hear. There's a difference. Well, that's like, like all of us. Everybody wants what they want. And people don't necessarily want what they need. You know, everybody tells God what they, here's what I need, God. You need transportation to get to work, but you're telling God you need a Mercedes Benz. You're dictating, here's what I need, right? Well, when it's funny. I had this. Like the bus, right? Well, you know, you're funny when you say that. You remind me a lot of my parents. I like you, Bill, a lot. I feel like I'm ah. home with you. No, I do. I do because you, you say so much. But you say a lot of how I was raised. My mother had this lady and she came to my mother and my, she was complaining to my mother because my mother was very, very spiritual and religious. We used to go to Sunday school and Greek school and church. I mean, we, we went the whole ball of wax and there was no, I don't want to go. You went. <laughs> and I remember this lady, she said to my mother, I do pray to God and everything I want, I just don't get. And my mother looked at her very calmly and she says, well, you did get your answer. She goes, I haven't gotten my answer. She goes, God told you no. <laughs> there you go. There, there you go. Yeah. I said, really, mom? And she goes, yeah. She goes, stop getting mad at God. That's what I'm giving to you. Maybe it's just not time for you to have it. <laughs> see, you see, most, most people... I'm being very general on this. Most people have this concept, God is the great Santa Claus. Right. So with a list. I need this. I need this. I want this. I definitely want this and blah, blah, blah. And I got this disease. Take it away. I got my grandma's 98 years old. She's going to die. Please help her. She, to keep her alive. I mean, all kinds of things. Instead of just praying to God, give me what I need. Give me the tools, the courage to handle whatever I need. Don't take anything away. Because as you say, life is a school, so you got can't take the lessons away. Right. But Amen. you can, you're always going to get pain. You yeah. just want to avoid suffering. Well, sometimes even when we suffer, it actually can humble us. It can open up our pathways even more to think outside the box. Sometimes we have to be given a lesson that's really a tough one. Now, like I said earlier, it's up to us to what we do with that lesson. I like to think that, okay, I was given this because I had to learn this. You know, when I was young, I remember sometimes I would judge people. Like I remember going to a retail store and this guy was such a jerk behind the counter. And I said, what a jerk. What is wrong with these people? But now, <laughs> you know what I say? I wonder what's going on with this guy. Yeah, there's always a story in there. There's always a story. Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to you to uh, writing some of your stories down, at least a book. <laughs> I will one day, I promise. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hold to that. I'll be checking with you every year, see if you, how far you're along. Okay. And, and I'm looking forward to spending some time with you in St. I was going to say St. Geneva, in Lake <laughs> Geneva. I just think on my mind. Uh, but uh, it's... I it's my pleasure. I hope people uh, check out. What's your website? Let's have, I'm going to post it. But Okay. It's SusanRowland.com. Uh, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-W-L-E-N.com. They can go on my Facebook, Psychic Medium, Susan Rowland, my Instagram, Susan Rowland. Um, you'll see everything. So yeah, it's all there. Okay. And I'll try to put some data below in the explanation of this video. And yep. I'll I want to thank you. thank you for spending a Sunday afternoon with me. I'm upstairs in, in the big valley here in California where it's uh, 110 degrees upstairs in this room, but I'm trying to look like I'm not sweating. <laughs>
You look great. <laughs> good. But I'm talking to somebody in Arizona, so it's kind of like it's what it's only 100, only 109 here right now, and I'm going. You guys got to be at least. I was going to say it's cool. Yeah, yeah, we're like 124. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I've I've been there in Arizona. I just go. Yeah, I'm coming back again. I will be there. I'll be in Sedona. Oh. I'll be in a place called Cornville, if you can believe that, and uh, Mesa, oh. and in Tucson and Phoenix. So. Really? I, I will see you next year, hopefully. Oh, I would love to. Please let me know. I would love to. I'd love to meet with you. I really would in person. But for sure, in November, we will meet. And I, I so look forward to it. And I just want to say thank you for this beautiful interview and allowing me to come on your platform. I can't say thank you enough. I mean that sincerely. And, and, and as we were talking earlier, tell your husband, thank you for his service. Oh, and I thank you every day for your service. Each and, 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 and that picture behind you, uh, <laughs> that is a portrait of your daughter. It is. It is. So, yeah. Because I will get comments like, what's what, you, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. She's, um, she's very big into photography and uh, videoing. She does a lot with uh, veterans and, uh, um, you know, firearms of the biggest companies out there. And she does their work of photographing their, their, their video and their photography. And then she's also a high fashion photographer. So she splits her time with both. And you know what? She's good behind that camera. <laughs> yeah. You said high fashion. I believe she was in Vogue or she shot pictures for Vogue or one of those big she's magazines. She's actually been published 32 times in Vogue, her work. Yeah, that's that's good credentials. She's really good. And I, I, I know I'm her mother, but she really is talented. And I could never do what she does because she's, I tell you, she's got an eye and she really can see things. But she also has a big, big thing with the veteran community. And I'm my, my husband and I are very proud of her for that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank you. And I will, uh, we'll be talking later. God yeah. bless. God bless you too. And, and you have uh, to stay cool. 